everyone. Good afternoon and welcome. I would like to thank you all for joining us today um, for the Spartans at Ishmael Talk with John Fry. My name is Alyssa Dietrich and I will be moderating today's um, discussion. I'm a fourth year undergraduate here at MSU, double majoring in art history and supply chain management. Before we begin our discussion, for those of you who are new to Zoom, I would like to direct you to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You may use the Q&A button to submit questions you have at any point during the webinar. We will keep track of your questions and be sure to address them at the end of the presentation. Um, I would also like to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel within the next few days for those who couldn't make it today or if you're interested in watching it back. Um, the only faces that are going to be shown today and on the recorded version are those of the presenters, so you don't have to worry about your camera or your microphone. I would now like to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, John Fry is a classical archaeologist and an associate professor of classical studies at, in the Department of Art, Art History and Design. He received his BA from The Ohio State University and his MA and PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. And he is also the director of the Michigan State University Excavations at Ishmia. This project has helped to increase accessibility to the study and practice of archaeology through the use of digital technology. I personally have been working with John since my freshman year as a research assistant, and I've helped out on various projects concerning the site of Ishmia. I even got to finally go there over this last summer, so I can say firsthand that what's happening at Ishmia is super exciting. And now I will hand it over to John to tell you more about what's going on. Thank you so much, Alyssa. It's it's nice to see it's nice to see Alyssa without a without a mask on, and we haven't had the chance to do that for quite some time. So, hi everybody. I'm I'm John. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Alyssa. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and start. Let's see if I can do this here. I'll switch over. Can I get a thumbs up to make sure I'm showing the right thing? Can you see the? Hey, there's a raised hand, so we're we're all good. Um, yeah, so the, so the, first of all, I just want to really, uh, I want to thank Marsha, I want to thank Monica, Christine, uh, Cindy, thank you everybody for giving me the opportunity uh, to spend a little bit of time uh, on the conversations with Cal, uh, um, um, uh, to, to host the conversations with Cal event, and to be able to introduce the dig uh, to the MSU community. I uh, titled it Spartans at Ismia. As it turns out, uh, Spartans have been at Ismia with me at least since uh, 2008 when I started leading uh, MSU study abroad. Uh, uh, at that point, it was uh, an archeological project sponsored by the Ohio State University, uh, but uh, my, my Spartan students never missed an opportunity to put their little marks somewhere here and there at the dig. I absolutely love this image. This is uh, Becca and Leah uh, leaving a block S on the underside of a of a table that we used to, uh, to sort pottery at the dig. So it's still fun now that the, now that the dig is actually uh, sponsored by Michigan State University and I'm the director, it's still fun to go back and find these little places behind doors and under shutters and things like that where uh, Spartans have left their mark already. So uh, let me help orient you a little bit here uh, with a couple of maps. Uh, Ismia is located just on the southeastern side. You can kind of see the little arrow here on the southeastern side of the Isthmus of Greece. So it's this tiny little bridge of land uh, that connects northern and central Greece to the area we refer to as the Peloponnese or southern Greece. Uh, Isthmia was incredibly important in antiquity as the, the sanctuary of Poseidon that sat right next to one of the major routes of passage into southern Greece. So on the right hand side of this image here, you'll see the little red roadways uh, and the major road that went from Athens through the Isthmus and down into southern Greece passed right by Isthmia on its way to places like Epidaurus, Corinth, and yes, eventually even uh, Sparta. So Isthmia was famous mythologically uh, uh, it, it has a couple of mythological connections. It was famous mythologically as the burial place of a local hero by the name of Melikertes or Palaimon. He has a bit of a tragic backstory. Um, his mother Eno and his father Athamas uh, were aunt and uncle to the god Dionysus. And Dionysus was uh, given over to them for care when he was a little baby. This incurred the anger of Dionysus' stepmother, uh, Hera, who made uh, Athamas, uh, 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 gave him a fit of madness 
and caused him to desire to kill his own children. Uh, he ends up being, as you see in this picture, somewhat successful with his son, Athamas. Uh, but then in the background, in this sort of multi-shot uh, uh, image of Eno doing this, Eno grabbed her son, uh, Melikertes, and uh, grabbed him and jumped into the sea. At which time, Eno became a goddess. And Melikertes' uh, unfortunate uh, uh, demise, uh, he, his body was carried uh, to the area just off the coast of, of Isthmia where he was found by the Corinthian king Sisyphus, uh, that's Sisyphus of up the hill rock pushing fame, uh, who um, took the boy, buried him and dedicated games in his honor. One other story that I just can't help myself but tell you, uh, Ismia was also uh, the location of a local bandit by the name of Sinis. And so you see the balding bearded guy on the right hand side here. Sinis was a particularly nasty person he would take local travelers that were passing through the area, and he would somehow convince them to uh, allow him to tie their arms and legs to opposing pine trees that he had bent down. And then much to his own personal delight and the, the absolute horror of the travelers, he would let the pine trees go and the, the person would be ripped asunder. Uh, what you see in this case right here is the uh, Athenian and Greek hero Theseus, who comes through the area of Isthmia and catches Sinus and gives him a taste of his own medicine and dispatches the bandit, thus making the area safe for travelers again. Both of these sort of heroes and heroic gestures would have been commemorated uh, by what we know as the Isthmian Games. Uh, you're familiar with the Olympic Games. The Isthmian Games occurred every two years in cycle with the Olympic Games, the Games at Delphi, and the Games at a local site. Uh, nearby called Nemea. Uh, what's unique and interesting about the Isthmian Games is that in addition to athletic competitions like boxing and running and discus and the like, there were also competitions in recitations of Homer and in singing. So you could celebrate various forms of human accomplishment and human achievement as a way to worship the god Poseidon. Unfortunately, unlike those sites like Nemea, Delphi, and Olympia, uh, tourists don't come very often to Isthmia because we do not have large scale standing architecture. What you're looking at the top and bottom on the left hand side of the screen here is what's left of a temple of Poseidon or a temple to Poseidon. The second century AD traveler uh, Pausanias tells us that there is a lot of really nice stuff, very much worth looking at uh, when you come to Isthmia. He records a number of statues and buildings and things like that. He talks about the, the white marble on the theater. But unfortunately, when we got to it today, or, or more properly in the 1950s, most of that had actually been stripped from the sanctuary. So if you look at the top left of this screen here, here is the sanctuary proper with the temple, the theater, and the baths. A lot of that material was actually disassembled and then moved over to the area you see right here in order to form a Byzantine fortress. So as it turns out, most of the pieces of the classical and Roman period sanctuary are actually embedded in the late Roman period walls uh, of the defensive works that protected Southern Greece uh, from invasion from the north from about the fifth century AD and on. Now, that doesn't mean that there haven't been things to find. And so uh, the gentleman in the top left of your screen here you see is Oscar Bernier. In 1952, on his first trench in the area, he uncovered the remains of the temple and studied it. He went on to discover things like the stadium, things like the theater, uh, and uh, sank one trench and discovered a, a Roman period bath. In 1967, his work was continued by Paul Clement. You see him up at the top right. And the dig passed to the University of California, Los Angeles from Oscar Bernier's home institution of the University of Chicago. Oscar Bernier's work is carried on uh, by the uh, lady at the, on the right-hand side of the bottom left of the screen. That's Elizabeth Gebhard, who still directs the University of Chicago excavations at Ismia. In 1986, the excavation passed to my predecessor and my mentor, Timothy Gregory, and that's when Ohio State took over the dig. And then in 2020, uh, uh, Tim handed the dig on to me, and I've taken on this immense responsibility of overseeing the operations that used to be the Ohio State University excavations, now are the Michigan State University excavations at Ismia. Uh, over the years, they have found a number of firsts, a number of impressive things, 
that you may not have lots and lots of standing architecture, but historically, archaeologically, the site, as it turns out, is incredibly important. So what you're seeing here are the remains of a large basin and a drawn reconstruction of what the first temple of Poseidon looked like uh, in the uh, late seventh century BC. Uh, Ismia lays claim to potentially being the location of one of the earliest Doric style temples in all of Greece. Uh, there's a lot of curious features of this building. For example, in the reconstruction you see here, there's fairly good evidence for the fact that unlike solid, in, in distinction to solid marble walls, uh, the, the temple may have actually had painted plaster panels on the wall. So the, the decoration would have been a whole bunch of painted scenes on the wall, which is kind of exciting and unique for the site. The site also featured, uh, as was required for the athletic competitions, featured a running track. Foot races were incredibly important in the ancient world as part of athletic competitions. And so what we're actually looking at here is a very unique, we know of no other example of this in the ancient world, a unique attempt uh, to ensure fair starts in foot races to keep people from cheating. So you see our handsome little gentleman there holding a whole bunch of strings. The idea is, is that you would let go of the strings and these little wooden gates would open, letting the runners know that it was time uh, to start running. Uh, it's fun every summer to take my Spartans and to let them uh, 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 try out and then discuss why this wasn't a terribly good solution to ensuring fair starts in a foot race. So on the bottom right there, you see uh, study abroad students from 2018, if I'm not mistaken, uh, trying out the running track uh, at Ismia. Uh, the thing I've been working on mostly uh, is seen here in this plan and the, and the uh, image up on the top left there. This is the Roman bath at Ismia. Excavations of this area started in about the 1970s uh, and continued on through the middle of the 1980s and into the early 1990s, where they uncovered uh, a very large second century AD Roman style bathing structure. Romans loved a nice bath. Uh, they would treat it pretty much like a, a spa. They would go through different hot rooms, cold rooms, wet rooms, dry rooms. It was a very leisurely long kind of way to spend uh, a day. Uh, the excavations uncovered an enormous eight meter by 20 meter uh, bichrome mosaic made entirely out of pieces of white and black uh, uh, little marble tesserae. Uh, but what they also discovered was that uh, when the bath collapsed, you can see this person here standing in the bottom left, standing in the divot in the floor left by the collapsed remains of the bath. This meant that throughout the 1990s, the mosaic had to be restored. And so in a very, very unique, I don't know of any other case where it's been tried on this scale, uh, archeologists under Timothy Gregory lifted the whole entire mosaic. Uh, they attached canvas to the back of the tesserae, and then they would uh, dig under them and peel the whole thing up. Uh, they dug underneath it, revealing the remains of a Greek pool underneath. Uh, and then they, you see here in the top left, they relayed the mosaic, showing you what you see here in the image on the right. Uh, so enough of what's happened in the past at Ismia. Uh, I can say, uh, uh, express a, a profound sense of gratitude to Timothy Gregory, who was my mentor, my undergraduate uh, uh, instructor, my thesis advisor, uh, uh, and, and essentially kind of a, 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 my, my archaeology father in Greece. Uh, and so I've worked with him for many, many years, and he has left me a project that is innovative and is in very good shape and ready to do exciting new things in the future. For example, what you're seeing here is the upstairs of the, what we refer to as the dig house, or the excavation house, uh, which was completed only about 10 years ago. It is a wonderful place for study, for use of the archives, for analysis of objects and artifacts. So you see a whole bunch of MSU students here photographing, scanning, working with artifacts, working with our, uh, um, archival uh, records in the upstairs of the dig house. So what have we been doing lately? I'd like to think of ISMI as a place where uh, we're encouraging lots of innovation, we're encouraging lots of, of trying out new things, lots of digitally enhanced archaeology. So for example, one of the things we've been doing is trying to follow my predecessor's uh, um, uh, impulse to share as much as possible with as wide a community as possible who are interested in archaeology. So we have been engaged in the process for about the last 10 years of digitizing the contents of the archives and sharing them freely online. Uh, 
You can see here these are web-based code. You can see records of the original field journals, photographs, color slides, uh, reports, drawings, all kinds of different things. So we're innovative in the sense that we're trying to provide open access to things that were usually just because of location and time of year, were usually off limits to the vast majority of uh, archeologists and the public at large. We also like to treat ISMIA as a test bed for trying out new technologies. So new ways to engage in digital archeology. span So you see here on the left-hand side, me trying to film a very, very good friend and colleague, James Herbst uh, from the nearby excavations in Corinth, who in October of 2016, uh, donated about four or five days of its time, of his time very, very early in the morning and very late in the evening uh, when the shadows weren't so bad. And we together used drone footage in order to recreate a 3D model of the whole entire site. And that's what you're seeing in the image on the right. Again, providing the whole entire model uh, freely open access to anyone who's interested in taking a closer look at Ismia from the air. Just this past year, you can see a listen in a couple of these pictures. Uh, uh, just this past uh, summer, a really good colleague of mine, Daniel Trago from the College of Arts and Letters, uh, went with me and we tried to do something new here where we attempted to photograph and videotape uh, every moment, every possible moment of, of education and exploration of the dig on the study abroad. We ran a study abroad of two. You can see Stephen Bush there on the left and Alyssa uh, there on the right. I Guess I'm demonstrating how you wear a pot on your head. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, the only other person to point out to here is Lida Zorzokulu Gregory, who serves very, very kindly as my assistant director. Uh, and so she, she helps me with things over here uh, on, on the Greek side. Uh, and so she also uh, lent a hand. And you can see, I've picked you a couple of pictures where there is always, Alyssa could attest to this, there was always a GoPro within 10 feet somewhere. And Dan was always photographing and videotaping. The goal here is to attempt to recreate the study abroad experience for people who may not be able to travel to Greece. So we're, with Alyssa's help, we're in the process of uh, processing all the videos and all of the images in order to create a virtual study abroad uh, for MSU students. Uh, one of the things that I'm trying really hard to do, one of the things that my predecessor did very well and I'm trying to keep up his tradition, is to work very hard to connect with the local community and the community back here in Lansing. So I'll show you just a couple of slides from last summer. Uh, one of the activities that we engaged in as part of the virtual study abroad we were attempting to film was conversations with locals from the village where the excavation is located. So you see here that uh, we put together Alyssa and Stephen with a couple of uh, uh, college age students from the village of Kiravrisi. In the back at the far end of the table, is Sotiri Peras and his wife, Jean Peras, who work on the University of Chicago side uh, of the excavations. And Sotiri is actually uh, the local vice mayor. So it's very, very good to know him. He's very helpful. On the right-hand side, we have Alyssa hanging out with Ageliki Kadri, who serves as our conservator. So she's busy uh, showing Alyssa how one goes about uh, conserving pottery and uh, gluing back together vases and keeping everything uh, together and clean and conserved. So lots of opportunity. We're looking for opportunity to engage with uh, uh, the Greek community, with the local Kiarvisi community, but also to draw on the expertise of Greek archaeologists and Greek specialists. The same thing uh, is true about the community here in Lansing. I'm trying very hard to connect uh, with the Greek American community and with any of the folks at uh, uh, Michigan State University who are interested in the types of collaborations that we could do. So we've worked in the past with the School of Packaging. Alyssa and I are currently trying to work with folks over in agriculture. We've worked with people in technology. We've worked a lot with the College of Arts and Letters. At this point, I can give a shout out to Brian Adams and Scott Shropray for their help on all things technical. Uh, and so uh, the other thing that I'm very, very proud of here in terms of outreach is, uh, thanks to Daniel Trago's help, uh, we have built a new website for the MSU excavations at Ismia, and it should not be the case, but it is absolutely the case uh, that it is a rare thing that an American archaeological excavation has provided their website both in Greek and English. And so I'm really, really proud of the fact that we actually keep companion Greek and English websites. So you can visit that at msuismia.org. And if you wanna see what it looks like in Greek, click on the little Greek flag up there on the top right hand side and uh, you can peruse the website that way. So it's just a small, it's a small gesture, but I think it's an important one 
to attempt to engage the Greek speaking community about an archaeological site that occurs right in the middle of their village. We also maintain a Facebook group, uh, not as well as I'd like to, but uh, here we are celebrating the work of a couple of colleagues who came over this past summer from Prairie View uh, down in Texas, uh, Prairie View A&M. Uh, and over the course of a week, uh, Bill, Batson, Bill Batson and Stefan uh, together, uh, 3D laser scanned the bath. Uh, and so you can see there's a lot of things coming together there. There's work in the bath, there's technology, there's outreach, there's working with the Facebook group. So this is the type of sort of innovation and forward-looking digital archaeology that we're attempting uh, to engage in. Uh, one of the side pet projects for me uh, that comes out of my fascination in working with the archives and digitizing the archives and engaging in public outreach is my attempt to reconnect with archaeologists from the UCLA and Ohio State and University of Chicago days at ISMIA. So you see here on the left, sitting atop uh, the remains of the Byzantine fortress she helped to excavate, that's Brigitte Wool, who is a phenomenal scholar and is out in the Los Angeles area. She works at the Getty. She's just recently uh, wrapped up a publication of the Roman period. Uh, and I will, in January, be going out to see her and the individual on the right, that's David Wilson, who in the 1970s excavated an incredibly important part of the site uh, that we're re-exploring now and coming up with exciting new conclusions about how the site functioned in the transition from the Greek to the Roman period. So I'm really looking forward to hanging out with David Wilson as well. What we're trying to do is engage in an oral history project where we ask the old archeologists what it was like to work at Isthmia and to work in Greece in the 1960s and 1970s, but then also to have a companion side to that, where we are encouraging members of the local community who worked at the site on the Greek side uh, to share their stories as well. Finally, I got to throw him in here. Uh, I think that we're close to finally. Uh, I want to see Isthmia be a place for creativity. So, wow, wow, actually, Alyssa, look, we have you and Dan in there. So, uh, uh, Daniel Trago was the uh, uh, Cal educational technology uh, person who came and helped me this summer. In addition to being absolutely phenomenal scholar in second language acquisition and a, a kind of guru about things study abroad, he is also very, very smart in the ways of educational technology and technology in general. He helped me build the website. Uh, we got home from Greece and I realized that the whole entire summer long, he had been taking just the most amazing photographs of Isthmia and Greece. And so thanks to Jacqueline Sullivan and the MSU Union Gallery, uh, we have secured space through, from December through February. And so we'll be opening a show featuring the photographs of, of Isthmia and Greece taken by Daniel Trego. Uh, so look for flyers for that and that kind of thing. I'm very uh, um, uh, much looking forward to keeping up with the type of work that Daniel Trego did. Uh, and it would be very exciting actually moving forward to attempt, in addition to having archaeologists and study abroad students come over, to attempt to establish an artist in residence program at ISMIA. We've had a great deal of luck and a great deal of exciting work come out of our work with graduate students in the Department of Art, Art History and Design who have come over to work with me. And Dan just kind of helped reignite uh, that fascination with what happens when you take art artists to Greece and just let them play. Uh, so we're really, really excited about that as well. And I think this is nearly my last uh, slide. And so hopefully this is enough to kind of give us things to talk about. Uh, I want Isthmia to be a place for opportunity, a place where people who may not have thought they wanted to travel to Greece, who may not have thought they were interested in archeology span or people who are interested in Greek and Roman history and never thought that they would be able to uh, uh, pursue, their, pursue their ideas and their excitement for this in a meaningful way. I want Isthmia to be a place for them. Uh, so what you see here on the left is me in the backwards ball cap uh, in 1995, excavating my first trench with, you see the gentleman in the purple shirt there, that is Dr. Nick Cordulius, who was my uh, field, field uh, supervisor and mentor at ISMIA II, uh, supervising me on my excavation of my first trench ever in 1995, and it quite simply single-handedly changed my life. Uh, it is such a joy and honor. It is such a, a, a lucky turn of events that I have been able to come back to the place where I discovered my love of classical archaeology and to actually run the project. It is such an amazing experience and it gives me no end of joy every summer 
to be able to bring students with me and to see if I can't do the same thing for them, to help them discover what they love, to help them discover a little bit more about themselves. And so this is what excites me most, is being able to bring Spartans to Ismia and to help them make their mark. Uh, so with that, I will close with Spartans atop the mountain just near to Ismia. You can see the Corinthian Gulf in the distance. And so these are study abroad students, I think maybe 2014, 2015, something like that, making their mark uh, in the Corinthia. So with that, I will, I will wrap things up and let Alyssa kind of monitor questions and I'm happy to answer anything you have for me. So thank you. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Don't take it away, don't take it away. I have like all of these notes to myself and what do you know, I went and forgot it anyway. So uh, maybe we can edit this part out, <laughs> the part where I'm just bumbling. Most important of all, um, it, it is really, really important and I'm embarrassed that, it, that I have to come back to it. I want to give my just deep, deep, profound thanks and, and an expression of gratitude to the College of Letters. It is a rare thing for a large scale legacy excavation to change hands between universities. It is a rare thing for a big 10 university to take over sponsorship of a dig. It is not a cheap thing. Uh, and it was just an, uh, an absolutely wonderful surprise and a, and a wonderfully encouraging thing to have my chairperson in my department, Karen Zitzovitz, to have my dean, Dean Long, to have Sonia Frischi, Bill Hart Davidson, Kara Solano, to have everybody not even ask if this was worthwhile. They all jumped up and said, yes, absolutely. We wanna support this dig. And I just am profoundly grateful for their support. I also wanna thank uh, the tireless support of the marketing and communications folks, Ryan uh, Kilcoin, uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick. I wanna thank Christina Radke. I could just go on and on. I've already thanked Daniel Trago, but I should thank him again. So thanks to everybody for honestly, never once asking, you know, should we do this? And just saying yes and how. And, and I just really, really hope that I can repay the, the confidence that, that people have placed in me uh, to do a good job with our students. And, and with that, I really am gonna turn it back over to Alyssa. Hi again, everyone. Yeah, I can speak to the, as a participant of a two-person study abroad, I still had an amazing time. It was definitely well, well worth my time. And I, I loved going to Ishmia. So I wanna go back. Don't know how I'm gonna figure that one out, but. We'll, we'll um, figure it out, Alyssa. we'll get you back. Yeah, so here is our first question. It is, what kind of traffic do the online archives get? I'll, I will be honest with you, not a huge amount right now. Um, partly because we, um, partly because ISMIA is kind of a shoestring budget operation. We do not have the large endowments, uh, you know, hopefully someday, uh, we do not have the large endowments that are enjoyed by some of the, some nationally sponsored uh, uh, or museum sponsored excavations. So we kind of have to go as we go. So the online digital archive is, is being built up as we're able to scan stuff every summer. So it's not a complete archive. And I have been relying a great deal on crowdsourcing and the uh, uh, paid internships of student uh, undergraduate student assistants to help build up the collection, to make it more integrated, to make it more meaningful. Um, there's a little bit of faith in this. It's like, a, if you build it, they'll come kind of moment. Uh, but at least, you know, among the sort of the group of Isthmia scholars who are doing research there, it is used quite frequently. I would like to see it used more openly by a much, much wider community, but I am hopeful that that will come as the online archive achieves a sort of critical mass of information and inter all right, then we do have some follow up questions, but I kind of feel like you answered them, but I'll give you another opportunity. Um, what is the target audience for your archive and what do you hope it becomes? I, you know what, I, I mean, I, I thank you for the opportunity to embellish a bit on this. Um, one, one, of the, one of the things that classical archaeology is, is currently having to reckon with uh, is its long history of I don't know what you call it. Um, I don't know if elitism is the right word, but, but it's long association with elite culture and privilege. Uh, classical archeology span and classical art 
are you know typically the plaything of the individuals who can afford to to acquire such things or museums with endowments big enough to acquire and display such things so we can think like you know the new york met the getty villa you know uh you know programs that can that can do that uh and there's a certain amount of 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 I think we're we're recognizing this and realizing this now. There's a certain amount of exclusion that happens with that. Uh, and what we're trying to do at Isthmia uh, is open up classical archaeology to a wider audience. And that that works on a number of levels. Uh, it works on the level of students who thought that they wouldn't ever be able to travel to Greece, who were interested in archaeology, just wanted to try it out. I want to empower and enable those students to come over and to see for themselves whether it's really for them. Uh, so we do that through scholarships, we do that through enabling them through the study abroad, through recruiting uh, and through encouraging students from underrepresented populations that this is in fact for them. Um, I want to engage a great deal more with the Central Michigan Greek American community and also with the Greek community in Greece. There is a a long history of Greeks not being terribly deeply engaged with the archaeology happening in their own backyards. And there's long traditional reasons for that as well, uh, but I think it's important to encourage any Greek students who want to come study, master students, bachelor students, anybody from the local community who wants to volunteer and engage to be able to do so. Uh, so I think for far too long, archaeology, especially classical archaeology, has been a plaything of scholars and the well-to-do and how we open it up to a wider range of people is something that I think we're exploring, you know, or we, we should be exploring uh, every day that we're at the dig. Awesome. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, our next question is, um, we have a member in the audience that was a student participant on a study abroad almost 50 years ago in Israel who worked on excavating a synagogue. Um, they are wondering what the typical work day looks like on um, your study abroad trips. Well, it, would, it wouldn't be the workday Alyssa got, which was, you know, camera in your face from the moment you wake up and it, like just following you around like the, like, a, like the Kardashians or something. But uh, so it, it's interesting because the, the dig day for me depends on whether or not I have students. Uh, so typically in the summer, I'll run a study abroad for about four weeks. Um, it has... It is a rare thing, I should point that out too. And this is a tradition that I owe to my predecessor and my mentor, Timothy Gregory. It is a rare thing for undergraduate students to have this much sort of unrestricted access to an archeological excavation. One of, the, one of the traditions of classical archeology span is that you typically don't get into the field and get to do archeology span until you're a graduate student. Um, but as an undergraduate, I was, welcomed onto the dig. I was encouraged to participate as part of uh, Tim Gregory's study abroad. It's been really important to me to do the same for my own students. Uh, and so um, I'll typically run a program in May and June where my students come and work on the dig. For them, a day will be up at seven to the dig by about 7.30. Uh, depending on what we do that day, it'll be a mix of field work and office work. Um, the day, because of the restrictions uh, that uh, are associated with the rules to the Ministry of Culture and the Greek government, uh, the typical work day at the excavation is between 7.30 and 2 or 8 and 2. Uh, so we get as much done on site as possible. Uh, we typically go back to wherever we're staying. I give them a little bit of a break and then we save the evenings for educational opportunities for conversations or occasionally even for additional sort of digital archaeological work uh, back at the hotel or back at wherever we're staying. Uh, once the students go home, uh, typically a larger number of scholars come to do their own work. And my day is typically, again, restricted to eight to two, but my day is typically get up and try and find the ways in which I can support the needs of scholars who are there. Typically that's uh, you know, pulling artifacts, finding records, photographing things, scanning things, helping be there for scholars. Um, I'm learning now uh, as the director of the project that uh, previously, before I was the director, I think that uh, uh, my, the, the previous director did a very good job of shielding 
young scholars from the, the sort of the daily trickle of requests that come in over the internet or that come in via letters or stuff like that from scholars. And I'm learning now uh, as the director, that's a almost a every other day occurrence. There'll be an email from a scholar who will want, you know, I can't travel to Greece this summer. Could you please photograph the following three artifacts for me so that I can publish them? So there's a lot of sort of helping to be, uh, you know, a facilitative open archive for scholars, uh, helping them. And then occasionally, uh, in the meantime, I'll have my own projects that I'm, that I'm trying to work on that uh, I'll get a little bit of time here and there to focus on. Awesome. All right. Our next question is, um, would you say that your first trip to Ishmael was your favorite and or do you have another trip that sticks out in significance to you personally? Alyssa, am I allowed to ask who asked that? Um, <laughs> no, I don't, 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 I don't. I don't have that. My favorite study of my favorite year at Ismia, hands down, no question asked, was 1995. Right. So I don't know who asked me that, but I'll answer because 1995 was the year I met my wife at Ismia. So uh, 1993 was my first year at Ismia. I took a year off to figure out if I really enjoyed Greece or not and found that I was just desperate to get back over the summer of 94. 1995, I knock on my professor's door and say, how do I get back here? And he made it possible for me. And as it turns out, a uh, really bright, talented uh, uh, woman on the study abroad that summer. Oh, we worked together a lot and we came back to America and started dating and uh, I married her a couple of years later. So uh, Susanna, uh, yeah, so, so 1995, my first trench, I met my wife. Um, that was the first year I really knew that that's what I absolutely wanted to do with my life. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, with, without a doubt, cl close seconds, 2008, uh, the year I took my first study abroad and I was able to kind of pay it forward and give back in the way that was given to me. Um, and then every year- I've 2021 in those. What? Yeah, see, I don't, yeah. This is, this is the problem. This is like uh, being asked by your children, who do you love more, right? So every study abroad is beautiful. Every, every study abroad is different in its own beautiful way. And so, uh, yeah, but, but the ones that stand out to me are 95 and 2008. All right, your next question is from Julia Lathan in the audience. Julia, she wants to, uh, 2008. <laughs> she wants to know if you ever thought about opening up study abroad to high school students. Susanna, Julia knows Susanna, so I can reference all this stuff. So, uh, oh my gosh. But I didn't know Julia would be here. And so it's it's good to hear you're here, Julia. Uh, Julia is, you know what, I, can I do this? I, I didn't even know if, if we're doing this anymore. Julia was my original Alyssa. So every, every now and again, I'm incredibly blessed to have students that for some reason that is entirely unknown to me, stick around and decide they wanna keep working with me. And uh, Julia was the first student who ever, I can still remember, Julia, 2006 in my classroom, you coming to me and wanting to do something with the Bible, I think, or something like that. A anyway, Julia stuck with me. Julia went off to teach Latin at Lansing Catholic High School and then headed off to the West Coast. And I hope to see her in January when I'm out there. Uh, and so I can't even remember the question. Yes, Susanna and I are trying to figure out a way to open it up to high school students, absolutely. Uh, you know, if we can work out a way to get as many people as possible to the site to play, I want people to have the same type of meaningful experiences I had, and it shouldn't just be restricted to students at MSU. It's good to hear from you, Julia. Awesome. All right. Your next question is, will the site of Ishmia become open to the public? So it is, um, you can, you can go and you can, and, and even. And I'll say this now, I don't know how many, 26 people in this thing, I, I can handle 26. I'll say this now, uh, if you show up at the museum and pay your, I think it's one, isn't it, Alyssa? One, one of row entry fee, it's, it's, it's no Acropolis Museum, right? So you know, apparently the, 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 the price scale is, is according to, yeah. There's nice things there. There are very nice things there. So it's a steal at one euro for your ticket. Uh, if you go in, Tell the guards to ask if I'm there. They will call over to where we work in the summer. And, and if I'm asked, I will give you a tour. I am more than happy to drop everything 
and show you all the cool things and um, give you all a behind the scenes off, off behind the ropes off limits tour uh, of the site. Um, anybody, anybody who says, hey, you know, call John, you know, and I happen to be there, I'm more than happy to do so. Uh, currently, what can you see? You can see the remains of the temple. You can see the remains of the theater. You can go down to the Roman bath and see the uh, mosaic and the different parts of the bath. Uh, there's a little sort of stumbling around in the fortifications. You can drive to the nearby fortress where there's a modern cemetery and a Byzantine church. Uh, and all of that stuff is generally uh, between 7.30 and 3.30, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, every day except Tuesday, I think, are, are open. Uh, and yeah, just buy a ticket and come for a visit. If you do and plan on coming though, please send me an email, let me know. I, I'd love to know, I'd love to meet fellow Spartans there and to take you on tours myself. Awesome. Uh, the next question is, how has COVID affected your program? How has COVID not affected our program, right, Alyssa? <laughs> um, yeah, again, I don't know. I don't know if my wife's on this, uh, on the, uh, is, is one of the participants or not, but she'll, she'll uh, she, 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 she rode me mercilessly throughout all of summer 2020. She's like, wow, yeah, because I, I, there is a, there is a verification process that anyone who takes over sponsorship of an excavation needs to go through. You need to give your academic credentials. You need letters from your dean, letters from the previous university. Everything has to be, all the documents have to be approved and all this kind of stuff before a transfer of directorship and institutional sponsorship has to happen or is able to happen. So all those things took all the way until, I don't know, like October of 2019, something I can't remember, but basically 2020 was COVID year, but it was also the first year that I was officially the director of the site. And so Susanna used to mock me every summer. She said, you're probably the only director who's never seen his own site. And so it, it was, yeah. So uh, I had a, a first rate uh, that I, we put together a heck of a team, Alyssa, that summer. That was gonna be it. That, no offense, Julia, no offense to 2008. That was gonna be a dream team. Yeah, I had students that I had had in classes more than once. They were a well-trained, well-oiled machine. And I had to sadly write them all an email and tell them we couldn't go. Uh, and so between 2020 and 2021, unfortunately, most people of that team have graduated. And they'll never get the chance to, to take them with me. Um, yeah, so no study abroad, and that's a real shame. Uh, I would say that I probably, I, I, you'd have to ask Alyssa, I would say that I probably get more out of having the students around than they get out of having me around. Uh, the energy and creativity and enthusiasm and excitement they bring for being in Greece is just infectious. And it is such a joy to be around them. And um, yeah, in some ways, not being able to do that, not being able to see the site, not being able to be there. Uh, people who know me know that uh, I, I kind of think of my, my annual year cyclically as this sort of up and down kind of thing. Uh, where I recharge my batteries in Greece, May through July through August, and then sort of slowly bring that energy back and drain it out here in Lansing until I can charge up again. So 2020 and 2021 were, the charger was broken. So, <laughs> so uh, I was happy to be able to get back last, well, to get back for 2021 uh, with Alyssa and Stephen and Daniel and kind of charge up and remember why I love doing this so much. So yeah, COVID affected us quite a bit. Uh, and there's a lot of catch up. There's a lot of, Alyssa knows this, there was a lot of cutting weeds and trimming olive trees and beating back grapevines just to get to the front door of the dig house. That, that much is true. I got to miss that part. So I just had to hear, I just heard about it. I didn't have to see it. Lots of trimming and beating things back into shape, which is, which is still happening. So yeah, so I don't know, that's, that's my COVID answer. So. All right, um, this next one, your next question, this might be, I think this is the last one, is what kind of tools would you like to see on the site that you don't currently have? What kind of tools? Oh, wow. Um, you know, in some ways we've, we've been pretty lucky in terms of the, the equipment, the archeological equipment we've been able to, to acquire. So 
Yeah, it would be nice to have a laser scanner, but those run in the tens of thousands of dollars. Um, we have GPS. We, uh, you know, it's always good to have more scanning equipment, more computer equipment. That would be very, very useful to have. Um, I don't know. How do you think the refrigerator is doing, Alyssa? It's, yeah. it's struggling against the Greek heat, but. Uh, <laughs> I mean, but, you know, heat waves don't make it easy, but. But I think Maybe some more AC than, for downstairs. Yeah, air conditioning units. Um, but I think more than specific items of equipment, what we really need are some fairly significant infrastructural upgrades. Um, I could I could share screen, but uh, uh, and, and show you some pictures. But the the dig house was built in the 1960s. Uh, and it is showing signs of wear and tear. Uh, the, the old wooden front door isn't as secure against the elements as it used to be anymore. The wooden, the, you know, I think, I think Alyssa, Alyssa would know this from hearing me say it over and over and over again this summer, but archaeology is a storage problem. Uh, you find things, and the moment you find things, they are in your care. It's your responsibility to protect them and to keep them in as good a shape as the day you found them. And that is a, that's a big commitment. Uh, so it requires lots of storage facilities, lots of, of you know, cons conservatorially safe and archivally safe storage. Uh, and the dig house that was built in the 1960s isn't exactly up to standard. So we uh, are in a space crunch, but we're also in a sort of conservation standards crunch. Uh, so what we really need to do is uh, better shelving units, better storage facilities, uh, air conditioning to climate control the place, uh, more secure doors and windows. So it's, it's infrastructure like that. And, you know, it's 500 euros here, 2000 euros there, 1000 euros here. And so, you know, those are, that's, you know, I apply for small grants all the time uh, from like the NEH and, uh, you know, and ask for the, you know, the college and uh, from NSF and stuff like that. Uh, but those little things kind of add up. Um, I know you didn't ask, you asked about equipment, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll go on because, because you gave me the, the opening to beg. Um, what we need more than anything right now, um, and, it's a, and it's a huge ask, uh, we need a roof for the mosaic in the bath. Uh, what you can, being somebody who goes every summer, uh, I have, you, I can see the progress of what's happened with the mosaic. So the mosaic was first discovered in the 1970s. It was found that to be in need of repair, uh, then enough money was raised to do the lifting and relaying of the mosaic in the 1990s. I, participated in the late 1990s in the final stages of that. And now it doesn't have, it's, it was a very big expensive project done according to conservation standards. It's a model project in that respect, uh, but it currently sits exposed to the elements. And that mosaic, if you think about it, was supposed to originally be under a huge brick vaulted roof. It was never supposed to be exposed to the sun and the rain, you know, and the wind and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so uh, we've been down the road of attempting to draw up architectural plans to build a roof over the whole entire bath structure. It is not going to be cheap. Uh, it's going to require lots of permission from the, the conservation department, the Ministry of Culture, the local inspectorate, uh, but it is something that is desperately needed. It would be a shame uh, to have excavated. It is it is arguably the largest mosaic of its type in the Eastern Mediterranean. I know they find absolutely beautiful, colorful mosaics in Turkey, Asia Minor, and Syria, places like that all the time. But the mosaic for the type that it is, is only, is only known at that size and with that type of decoration in one other place, and that's, that's in Ostia in, in Italy. Uh, and to have gone through the whole entire process of excavating it and restoring it and conserving it, to watch it sort of slowly decay in the elements uh, is it's it's hard to watch, and uh, we desperately need a large capital improvements uh, uh, project to to be able to fund a, a permanent roof over the structure. 
So it would have been easier just to say we need more trowels and shovels. We always need more wheelbarrows, but what we really need are, are fairly significant infrastructural improvements. All right, and then I do have, I think, two more, um, I have two comments for you um, from some people in the audience. Um, Is one of them, I, I have all the money you need? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but they are nice, so I will read them. Um, Jacqueline Mackey said, um, what a remarkable learning experience for Spartan archeologists and artists in the making. Thank you for pers your persistent, creative and collaborative work. Thank you. Um, and Sharon Park said, many kudos for, the, uh, for doing great work and including so many students. You're following in the steps of MSU professors, Wilson Myers, aerial photography of sites in Crete and Paul Dusen, I don't know how to say that one, in Italy. Thank you so much for making um, so much information about the um, ex excavations available. I'm wishing you great success in Ishmia. So thank you so much, and and I and I will I will say that 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 maybe I didn't emphasize that enough earlier on. It is, um, it's one exciting that the college and the university support the project, and we have a kind of unprecedented foothold in Greece now for a Big Ten university. We've inherited it right from Ohio State University, which is great. Um, but the other thing that's really exciting is is that uh, being at MSU, there is an immense wealth of expertise and ability and know-how that I can draw on. And it is, Alyssa knows this, should be, are we doing it? Do you wanna go down that road? Alyssa, Alyssa and I are currently engaging with faculty in natural resources and agriculture to try and find a more ecologically sound, environmentally friendly way to control weeds at the site. Weeds are constantly a problem. Uh, so we're currently working right with the folks over in turf sciences and things like that to try and find a, a, a good alternative uh, to what's usually done as sort of you know herbicides or, or mechanical trimming or something like that. Alyssa and I have a pet project. We're currently engaging with the ag, with the ag sciences folks because we're trying to figure out how to use goats in order to keep the weeds down. Pet project tried pet project. occasionally in Greece. I don't think tried variably very you know, sort of consistently, Not widely. <laughs> we want to, we want a Spartan, this is, this is, Alyssa and I are pushing for this, we want a Spartan goat uh, at Ismia, I just think it would be great, have a little Ismia, we get him a little sweater or something, right, and he can just yeah. year-round keep the, keep the weeds trimmed or something like that, but honestly, uh, uh, just recently we had to do uh, uh, a a uh, relatively technical scientific analysis of some pieces of pottery. Uh, Professor Melissa Morrison at Grand Valley State and I have been engaged in this uh, uh, ceramic study project. And um, uh, there is, oh my gosh, his name is escaping me right now. Professor Arbogast, if I'm not mistaken, uh, over in, in geology, uh, just out of the kindness of his heart uh, because uh, he had the same exact type of equipment here at MSU that we would be using once we got to Greece. And he spent hours uh, in Zoom meetings with us, making sure that we understood what the equipment could and couldn't do, how to work it, how to use the software. Uh, it was just super helpful to be able to rely on the expertise of MSU faculty and students. Uh, the project to share the online archives was done with the Matrix Center for uh, Digital Humanities and Social Sciences. So shout out to Matrix. It seems like whenever we have a problem, all I have to do is go to the MSU website and search for a faculty member who has the solution. So it's really exciting to be part of a university with so many resources to help kind of build out uh, what we can do at ISME. Okay, we have two more questions. So they just came in. So we'll do these, like, we have a couple more minutes. So we'll try to get through them. The first one is, would partnering with a library and information science archival program, either at the undergraduate or graduate level, maybe help to uh, boost archival scanning and funding? Uh, I could, if, if I wasn't entirely, by the way, the, the chaos that you're seeing behind me is like, is, is the clean part of my office. Um, in addition, with the directorship, I inherited the America side of the Isthmia archives. Uh, so we went down to Columbus, Ohio and came back with a U-Haul trailer full of 
archival materials. Um, old excavation field journals, uh, photographs, uh, uh, lots and lots of bibliography, reports, all different kinds of things. And uh, it's my plan uh, to attempt. Uh, oh, and, and Tim Gregory's slide, 35 millimeter slide archive, uh, which uh, I didn't even know how to describe, fills a whole entire wall. It's, it is an immense amount of material pictures of parts of Greece that don't even exist anymore. Uh, and it is my intention, uh, exactly as, as you're suggesting, to team with the folks over in uh, IMLS, to team with the library, and to figure out a way that we can make this a mutually beneficial thing. Students get to do archival work. Uh, we get an open archive of all of this material shared out. The public benefits, scholars benefit. I am all on board for a collaboration that way. All right, and I think this might be the one of your favorite questions is what I'm imagining it will be. How can individuals support you and the work being done at Ishmael? Send me an email. Tell me what you're interested in doing. Uh, let's figure out how we can work together. Honestly, just send me an email. F-R-E-Y-J-O-N-A at M-S-U dot E-D-U. I'm trying to, trying to get to the chat here. Uh, so, uh, please send me an email. Let's figure out ways that we can work together. Um, whether it's a, a, a creative project, uh, a technological project, whether there's, you know, whatever you wanna do. Uh, I, if you want to uh, make a, a gift and contribute to, you know, tell me how you want that to go. Do you want it to go to helping students get over to Greece for the first time ever? Do you want it to help students you know, learn while they're there? Do you want it to be committed toward uh, helping uh, publications, helping Greek students engage with archaeology in Greece? Uh, I'm, I'm all open. Uh, Ryan, the, the Ryans, Ryan Kilcorn and Ryan Fitzpatrick put together a video that I will ask uh, Marcia and, and Monica and, and Cindy to share out. Uh, I, I, they captured it perfectly and it has beautiful background music, so it's a lot better than I can do right now. But it's basically, if you have an idea for something you want to do at Ismia, let's work together, let's play. Uh, so that's kind of, it's, it's my open invitation. Awesome, thank you so much. I've been keeping an eye on the time and it looks like we're right at our mark. So with that being said, I want to thank you so much for speaking today. I know I really enjoyed getting to see more and I always enjoy hearing more about Ismia and all of the work that's being done there. Um, I would like to thank all of our attend or all of our attendees for taking the time out of their day to come watch. It means so much to have so many donors and alumni that care about the work and research that we're doing in the College of Arts and Letters. I hope you all have a great rest of your week. Go green. Go white. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Thank you everyone for coming. Bye.